Hello, everyone. Welcome to a, another Word for the Moment video log. I uh, have been uh, studying a very fascinating subject. Today's um, Word for the Moment will be really a continuation of what I did in the previous blog. I did a, the first blog on this subject, what does the Bible have to say about the rapture? And believe me, I'm not done with that. There is much yet to be said about the subject of rapture or catching away and how it uh, the scriptures portray the last days, our access to the realm of the unseen dimension of God, the dimension of faith, uh, just to be a little bit uh, up front here at the very outset of this blog, I, I want to be raptured every day. <laughs> I think I told the story in the previous blog of how, you know, Bob Jones and I had this conversation where he was, you know, talking about rapture. He said, I, I, I'm raptured every day. And that's exactly what the word means, to be caught away in the spirit. And I got to be honest with you, I want to be caught away in the spirit uh, on a very frequent basis. And then eventually, at the end of the age, there will be the translation of this living saints who will be caught up together with the resurrection of the saints of God. That's the, the heart of the message that I'm sharing uh, in the previous blog, today's blog, and at least probably two more to be able to get everything out that I want to share. You know, the subject of the coming of the Lord is so fantastic. It is extraordinary. The, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ is returning. That is, that is the, the subject of the hour. <laughs> that is the most important thing in every Christian's life right now, being made ready for the coming of the Lord. The Bible is profoundly clear that the Lord is returning to the earth. And when he does come, he's resurrecting the, the saints that have died, that have believed and overcome and lived a victorious life in him. And then those that happen to be alive uh, at that moment of time will be translated into the dimension of the spirit, changed, transformed in a moment of time. The scriptures say it plainly. And the Bible talks uh, quite a bit about the resurrection. Even the Lord himself spoke about it. I'm going to talk about that here in just a moment. But my point is our glorious Messiah is coming back for a people and I want you to know something. I believe the scriptures tell us the end of the age will be the greatest demonstration of glory the earth has ever seen. You know, one of the, we, I got wonderful remarks, you know, from the previous blog I did last week. Um, but one of the questions was, you know, there seems to be this thinking that maybe some of these supernatural dimensions of the spirit were somehow reserved for just the early church. Uh, I want to address that just briefly because we need to deal with that. Uh, the scriptures say the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. And the scripture tells us also in Hebrews chapter 13 that if we study and scrutinize and dissect and understand the lives of those that have gone before us, who brought the word of God to us, then imitate their faith. Um, he will do through us what he did through them because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In other words, what Paul lived, what John lived, what Peter lived was an example of a life yielded to the Lord. And there have been many examples throughout church history, undeniable men and women that have lived in this dimension of the spirit. It is undeniable. And then the scriptures talk about this generation that will be on the earth immediately prior to his return when he fulfills all prophetic scripture. All scripture must be fulfilled. And there will be a bride without spot or wrinkle. There will be a community of sons that do the work Jesus did and so on it goes. I've talked about this explicitly on various blogs and um, webinars and you know our table meeting that we do on Sunday. All of this, of course, is available on our app if someone would like to watch them. But one final point before I jump into this subject, I, I don't want these to be too long. I'm going to try to keep them 30 minutes or thereabouts or no more than that and then do a follow up, you know, after that. But, you know, we're at the end times. And anyone that has followed my ministry, at least mine and Amy's for any amount of time lately, you know that we have been talking about. Revelation chapter 10, 
the Lord coming to the earth with the now opened book in his hand. All the seals being broken, the fulfillment of all prophecy, all the mysteries that have been reserved for the end time um, being released into an end time generation. Now, someone might say there are no mysteries left. Well, Daniel said there would be. Daniel chapter 12 talked about things being sealed until the very end time generation. Daniel 12, 4, Daniel 12, 9. So there are things reserved. There are things that have been hidden in the heart of God. First Corinthians chapter 2, you know, things which eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard, things which have not yet even entered into the heart of man. All of that is going to be revealed by the Spirit to this end time company. It is what will perfect us. And so the Lord is coming with the now opened book, open scroll, as some translations say. <clears throat> setting his feet on the land and the sea. And of course, John, I believe in Revelation chapter 10, verses 8 through 11, is representing a uh, bridal community that will eat or devour, if you will, the revelation of Jesus Christ and become the expression of that revelation and prophesy on the earth. That's what it says, you must prophesy again concerning many nations, tongues, tribes, and kingdoms. And that is the end of the age harvest. Lord revealing himself through his people and one final glorious demonstration of himself where he gets the glory, <laughs> where he is the focal point, not men, not ministers. Oh no, this group of people, they're not going to take the glory for themselves. They're going to give it all to the Lord because he is going to reveal himself in such a profound way. It will bring in a great harvest of souls. My point is saying all of that is we are we are in that interval of time. I believe it wholeheartedly. We are in that interval of time. And so now we're we're viewing things through the, the lens of the fully open book. And so we're seeing things with a little bit, you know, more full or more complete picture. As the Lord begins to reveal these mysteries at the end of the age, we will revisit things that we thought we understood pretty thoroughly, and we're going to see them in a more complete way, a more full way. We're going to see dimensions of truth, perhaps, that we hadn't seen before because we're seeing through the lens of the now fully opened book. And these people will begin to eat that revelation. So let me try my best to stay focused on one subject of the first resurrection. The Bible talks about the first resurrection. Now, let me also address, before I do that, um, a question that people had. A lot of people, we had wonderful, wonderful responses. But um, this idea of, of there being a heavenly body and then the glorified or resurrected body, that, that, was, that was new to people. And let me just address that 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. So the body is separated from the spirit. The spirit goes to heaven uh, where the Lord is. And I can support that with many scriptures, but for the sake of time, we all know that. We go to heaven. We're with the Lord Jesus. But the Lord also talked about the resurrection of the body. So the Lord said, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the Lord will return and he'll have with him those that have gone before. Let me just read it very quickly. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And it begins to talk about the resurrection. So there is the heavenly body that you receive at the point of death, because to be absent from that body, the body of death, the body of Adam, the body we receive because of Adam, there is the spirit of man goes to heaven, but then the Lord returns with that community of people, resurrects that body, but transforms it and makes it glorified, a body like his. John says, we do not know what we'll be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And that is the resurrected, glorified body. And Jesus talked about that several places in his, in his ministry. And I'm going to come to that here in just a moment. So my point is the distinction of the heavenly body and the resurrected glorified body. The resurrected glorified body is like the one Jesus even said when he appeared to the disciples, touch me, handle me, I'm flesh and, flesh and bone. 
It was a tangible body that could be felt, but it also had a lot of supernatural potential. <laughs> he walked through the walls and did all manner of things. And we, we will go into some of this maybe in a future blog from 1 Corinthians 15, all the incredible benefits, this amazing, amazing thing that will take place, this first resurrection that Paul said, oh, if I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, he saw something prophetically. He knew that resurrection was going to be the most amazing thing when it happened. And he gave, he gave himself all oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. That's what he, that was his quest. That was his longing to be a part of that resurrection. So we come back, those that have died, come back with the Lord and they will be reunited in a resurrected body. The lock, the one, the Lord. That's the glorified resurrected body. So I hope you, hope you see that point. First, and there will be a resurrection, by the way. Some people, you know, say, well, you know, they have read or taught, been taught there was no resurrection. Let me just address that point very quickly, and then I'll move on. First Corinthians chapter 15 plainly says this. If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead. How do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. So Paul refutes that point explicitly. Absolutely. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That's, that is our fundamental belief that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God, manifested in flesh, lived on this earth, um, in a, in a sinless life, gave himself to be butchered and slain at the hands of his own creation, went into the grave for three days and three nights and came out of that grave in a glorified, resurrected body. That is our fundamental belief. And if he was raised from the dead, if he experienced a resurrection, then we will too. That is what Paul said. So there will be a resurrection, period, plain and simple, chapter and verse, as we say. So now let me just go forward now and spend the next, uh, you know, few minutes on just the subject of the first resurrection. We'll do another blog probably in a few days and I'll, I'm going to go back to the subject of rapture <laughs> because I want to really dig into that a little bit. You know what we, there will be a catching away, a translation of the saints, but, but before that happens, there will be a body of people that experience the unseen realm abundantly. I believe that wholeheartedly. He's going to open the heavens. There'll be a community of people that are like John that'll hear a voice say, come up here and I'll show you things to take place. It'll be like the Lord Jesus when he said, you know, in John chapter one, you know, talking to uh, Nathaniel, you're going to see something that are greater than a word of knowledge. You're going to see the heavens open and the angels ascending and descending upon the son of man. And he is our example and, and so forth. I'm going to address that further. And this incredible privilege is going to be given to this end time community of people. We have all of those who have died ahead of us surrounding us as testifiers to press into this so that they will be made perfect. I'll address that at some point. So now let me jump over to Revelation chapter 20. Frankly, there's just so much to be said about this subject. And it's my belief that we are to bring it forward, front and center, right in front of God's people, that we must begin to understand this dimension of the end of the age, the coming of the Lord and all of the various aspects of it. We can actually hasten the coming of the Lord by uniting and then coming into agreement with him. I believe that's part of what you see over in Revelation chapter 22. <clears throat> The spirit and the bride saying, come, this uniting, this consolidation, this agreement, this uh, oneness that comes between the, the spirit and the bride at the end of the age when they can say, come, Lord Jesus, come, and he will. That's amazing. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Now, this is talking about these this this community of overcoming saints that will rule and reign planet earth with the lord jesus christ 
It's in the Bible. Undeniable. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, the martyrs. And because of the word of God, those that have given their life because of God's word, not only in the very end of the age, but throughout church history. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, that beast system has been operating since for, for 1,700 years. Really, the spirit of it came on the day of Pentecost along with the Holy Spirit. They have not given themselves over to a counterfeit spirit, another Jesus. And those who did not worship the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So when will the resurrection happen? Before the thousand year reign. At the end of this age, uh, before the beginning of the next age, there will not be the 1,000 year reign of Christ until there has been a resurrection. I just read it to you. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were complete. This is the first resurrection. So there is a future resurrection, some people call it a second resurrection that happens at the end of the 1,000 year reign, the, the resurrection of the um, of everyone who's not resurrected here. I, I'll address that later. Some people call it the resurrection of the, um, of the unjust. We'll just leave it at that for now. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the 1,000 years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Listen to this statement. Blessed and holy is the one who was a part of the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Oh, my goodness. You know, the book of Revelation is the unique, most unique book of the Bible because John was taken and he saw it. He, Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, narrated big portions of the book of of uh, the revelation, John was seeing this firsthand. He was giving us an eyewitness account of future events as though they were already history. And as far as the spirit is concerned, this has already happened, but we haven't walked it out yet in the context of time. So John saw what Paul longed for, this resurrection, blessed and holy, are those that are part of this first resurrection. My prayer is, oh, Jesus, let everyone who hears the sound of my voice, let us be a part of that resurrection. All oh, that we may attain to the age to come and the resurrection of the dead. That's what Jesus said. It's in red in the Bible. And they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign. So when do we reign? When do the saints, of, when does Christ reign? It says, let me read the whole statement. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him. The reason I'm emphasizing that is because some people are thinking we're going to rule the systems of this world before the Lord returns. It says right here, we come back with him to rule and reign with Christ. The overcoming victorious saints that are the bridal community of prior ages will be resurrected. And we that happen to be alive in that moment of time will be translated with them changed in a moment of time and we will be united with the Lord in the air and and I believe go into the heavenly realm to experience the marriage supper of the Lamb and so forth. But I want to stay focused right now just on the subject of the resurrection, the first resurrection, blessed and holy are those, those that attain to this first resurrection that will experience this glory I believe, you know, Matthew 17, the transfiguration, you know, Peter, James, and John saw a little foretaste of what this is going to look like, this resurrected community. The Lord Jesus, of course, was resurrected. I mean, glorified, I should say, transformed. It's called the Mount of Transfiguration. He was transfigured in front of them, but basically his glorified form was revealed to them. Paul, Peter talks about this. First, uh, second Peter, I should say, says, we have not followed, Peter speaking, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is, the coming of the Lord. He's talking about, you know, the coming of the Lord when he comes for his people, when they are resurrected 
uh, and those that are alive are translated or transformed to be a part of that resurrection, to be a part of that community of people. He says, when we were with him on the holy mount. So he's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw the Lord coming in this glorified way at the coming of the Lord. So let me read the whole little passage here, these various verses. It says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty when we were with him on the holy mount. Therefore, we have a more sure word of prophecy and so forth. That's why Paul said, oh, let me be a part of that resurrection. That's why Jesus said those that are found worthy to attain to the age to come and the resurrection of the dead, he says they cannot even die anymore. Just imagine this image of what they saw on that mount. The glory, the light that was exuding from him, his face was shining like the sun. Can you imagine this day when you and I experience that because of our union with the Messiah? What a glorious and amazing day. Jesus said those that are worthy to be a part of the age to come and the resurrection of the dead cannot even die. For they are sons of God and sons of the resurrection. That's Luke chapter uh, 20, beginning around verse 35. You know, I want to point out something here on that passage while I'm there. You know, this passage in Luke, of course, it talks about it also over in Matthew 22, I believe it is. Um, but this is where the Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection, were trying to test the Lord. You'll remember the story where they gave him the scenario of a man that marries a woman and he dies and by Mosaic law, she was required to marry the brother and he died. And the next brother, seven brothers all died. And so they ask him the question, thinking they've trapped the Lord. <laughs> they say, so now you tell us, you know, teacher, whose who's, uh, wife will she be in the resurrection? And um, then the Lord. So, so here's my point. Their question is purely about the resurrection. But listen to his response. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection of the dead. So now he's connecting resurrection of the dead to the future age. Those that are considered worthy to attain to that age. Those that are found worthy to attain to the millennial age, the kingdom age, the, the age in which the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, they knew the Old Testament prophecies about the millennial reign of Christ, the kingdom age. So Jesus connected the resurrection to the future age to come. I hope you see my point. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither are married nor are given in marriage, for they cannot even die anymore. Wow. Because they are like angels and are son like angels. We're not angels, but we're sons of God. But we are like angels because we have this incredible potential that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ as our resurrected elder brother. They're like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in this passage about the burning bush, where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the, God, of, the God of the living is his point. I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. Listen to what it says here in Luke chapter 14. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So the, the Lord uses the resurrection here to, to portray that your, your charity, your, your, your love, your Christ-like attributes here will be rewarded at the point in time when there is the resurrection of the dead. When the Lord comes, the Bible says, and his reward is with him. And you are, you are rewarded for what you have done on the earth, whether good or bad. John chapter 5, let me just run through these scriptures so you have them. Because my point here is proving this first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those that have a part of this first resurrection. John 5, 25, truly I say to you, an hour is coming and now is. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear it will live. Oh, my goodness. 
the dead, those that are dead in Christ will hear the voice of the Son of God and they're coming out of the grave. You know, you might say, well, what about the guys that got burned at the stake? Listen, our sovereign God knows right where they are. All he needs is one little cell somewhere. <laughs> Listen, are you kidding me? I, I, you know, I get these questions sometimes. What about people that are eaten by wild beasts? It doesn't matter. The Lord knows right where they are. They're coming up out of, there will be a resurrection at the coming of the Lord. And they will, those that are, that are dead in Christ. I'm saying this, I'm, I'm still living now. So I don't know if I'm going to be a part of the resurrection or part of the translation. Thanks. I don't know yet. <laughs> That's yet to be determined. I kind of feel like I might live to see the Lord return. But uh, my wife says I will, so we're going to go with that. <clears throat> John chapter 5, verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and they will come forth, those who did the good deeds to the resurrection of life, and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. There it is. And you cannot deny the resurrection. Now, he's also now here talking about another resurrection. Now, he doesn't say it here, but we know taking rightly dividing the word, taking all of the word, consolidating all of these verses together to get the complete picture. We see there is a, a resurrection, the first resurrection before the millennial reign. Then the Bible tells us there is another resurrection at the end of the 1,000 year millennial reign. It's in Revelation chapter 20 when the unrighteous are brought before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, so there are the two resurrections. Clearly, there's more than one resurrection. The Bible says it plainly. Let me just jump over. So you have these scriptures, Acts chapter 24, beginning at verse 15. Having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there's, there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience, both before God and before me and all that had a vision. He had a revelation of this resurrection, the power of it, the glory of it, this amazing moment of time. So what am I saying? Listen, I'm encouraging us to believe the Lord, to live separated unto him, to allow the Holy Spirit to purge out of us everything that's not of him, to not be double-minded, but to, to have the mind of Christ, to believe every word proceeding from the mouth of God. The Lord is breathing on these scriptures. We are seeing them through a different lens now, the lens of fullness, the lens of the end of the age. You know, even Peter, when he talked about, you know, when he, when he witnessed the transfiguration, you know, one of the little tabernacles, and or the word there is booths, actually. And I know people have kind of beat Peter up a little bit on that. But, you know, maybe, maybe there was something in that that he recognized. This is talking about a future age when the, the Feast of Tabernacles is, is achieved in its fullness and all of its prophetic implications when the Lord tabernacles in a body of people and does through them everything that he said he would do. Um, so let me, uh, let me just read a couple more scriptures to you. So you have in John chapter 6, verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me. This is Jesus speaking, of course. That all, all that, that he has given me, I lose nothing but I raised them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Wow, that is Christianity 101. This is fundamental to our belief. We haven't preached it very much. It was preached quite a bit in the early church. But somehow we've gotten away. I know there's been a big emphasis on rapture, but we need to understand that this is a, a, a dual thing. There is the resurrection. This is a mighty, powerful thing. But then not everybody's going to be dead at that moment. There will be this trans, translation of this end of the age saints. But before that happens, the Lord is going to use those translated saints, those that come to the place of faith like Enoch had, by faith. Enoch did not taste death. But if you if you understand the life of Enoch, he was caught away or raptured, if you will, <laughs> frequently experienced the realm of the spirit. He obtained the testimony that he was pleasing to God. I believe the scriptures teach us 
that this end of the age community will experience the realm of the spirit the way these forerunners did, the way Paul did, the way John did. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. The full display of Christ in the earth, the glory of the Lord being released upon a body of people doing through them everything he did and so forth. I know I'm, I, the time is running out, so let me just, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I solemnly charge you the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing at his kingdom, the appearing, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's going to be a great release of resurrection power. You know, it even says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead abides in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will quicken and make alive your mortal body. And I tell you what, I believe that that resurrection power that is already resident in us will quicken this mortal body even before the coming. We don't have to live sick. The Lord purchased health and healing for us. That's right. We, we, can, we can walk in realms of the spirit where the effects of death are reversed. I believe that if, if, you know, if you walk by the laws of the spirit of the laws of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the laws of sin and death. I'm, I'm talking about some deep stuff here. I realize that. I know right now we're just trying to hang on and fill our cars with gas right now. <laughs> But there is this dimension in God that will be experienced. And even now is. I know some personal examples of people that are beginning to move in this realm. We're seeing it ourselves on a, on a level not yet to the fullness of what we are believing for. But the heavens are opening. That veil is very thin right now. Access is being given. And we're going to begin to see things and hear things and prophesy things by the spirit of prophecy. So this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those that are a part of this first resurrection. Lord Jesus, I ask that you give us the spirit to overcome. To overcome the spirit of this age. To overcome the spirit of this world. To overcome generational curses and plots and schemes of the devil. That we can live the life of them, those that are victorious the bridal community that lives in victory, that we may eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God and have white garments that are glistening and clean and even sit with Christ on his throne as he sat with, as he overcame and sat with the Father. Grant the spirit to overcome that we can have a vision of this like the apostle Paul and long for it with every fiber of our being Oh, that I may be a part of that first resurrection. I'm going to quote it one more time from Philippians 3. Oh, that I may know him. That's my prayer. That I may know him. That's your prayer. I know that. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Even now, even experiencing some resurrection power, the fellowship of his sufferings, even being conformed to his death, that we may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Those that are found worthy to attain to the age to come, Jesus said, and the resurrection of the dead. May that be released to you in fullness and the spirit of revelation rest upon you that we may see these scriptures in the light of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Grant that, Lord, I ask in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen.